permission to allow for an existing third family, third dwelling, three family dwellings are not permitted as a use in the zone. Permission was denied and the applicant is seeking variance. A permitted density is provided by section 6-203 and 6-205. And now you have to recognize Tom. Yep. There he is. Look at that. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a picture I took in January and I liked it a lot, so I figured I'd add it to my background. Sorry, it's for uh, 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 Before I get into the presentation, Larry Liebman was able to track down where Chip is. He's on Cape Cod, and Larry sent him a, 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 a text on his uh, uh, cell phone, so uh, he, he may still be thinking that board meets at eight o'clock uh, rather than at seven. Or he may just be vacationing on Cape Cod. And forgot. <laughs> we could go and join him. Sure. Uh, sounds like a good idea. Um, but before we do that, if I could uh, present to you, um, this is a, uh, uh, what I would say is a rather unique situation uh, and uh, I'd like to go through uh, uh, the application uh, with you. Uh, Jody, if you could bring up uh, slide number two. Sure, one second. Of your the presentation material, correct? Yeah, the presentation material that we sent on Friday. Sure. Oh, while Jody's doing that, uh, uh, this is an application to confirm a three-family house uh, the house that is at 46 Gold Street was built over 100 years ago. It was part of a 1901 subdivision map. Uh, property is bordered on two sides. And if we can go back to the second one, Jody. Great, thanks. So uh, property is uh, in the center of uh, the screen. Uh, to the south and to the west, south being the bottom of the page, uh, is the Sacred Heart uh, School Building that's associated with Sacred Heart Church, which is on Henry Street. Uh, behind or to the south of the church school building uh, is Metro North uh, Railroad tracks. Uh, the parking lot for uh, the, the church school uh, is both to the south and to the west uh, of 46 uh, Gold Street. Um, on the uh, uh, east side, uh, which showing up as a blue square, uh, is the uh, uh, freestanding garage uh, that actually you heard at the May 27th board meeting uh, as PLZE 2020-022. Uh, it, it was uh, granted a height and setback variances uh, at that meeting uh, in March, uh, May, May, excuse me. Uh, uh, this property uh, was part of a three lot, three lots owned by Dr. George Smith who is the father of the current owner. Uh, and if we can go to uh, the next slide, Jody. Thanks. Uh, here you get to see that parking lot that's on the south and, and west sides of my client's property. Uh, and uh, and their, their building being in the center. Um, in the uh, beginning of uh, 1985, Dr. Smith applied for variances and separate use of lots uh, that were for lots four, five, and six on the 19 uh, subdivision map, which was recorded as map 
162. Uh, we're currently recording maps that are uh, over 9,000 uh, in their number. Uh, each lot was 50 by 100 or a 5,000 square foot lot. And this was appeal 6934. Uh, the board granted the variances of area and frontage for each of the lots and the use to permit separate use of these 5,000 square foot lots. And what the board said that in that decision was, quote, hardship exists due to the fact that the lots are situated in a neighborhood substantially developed prior to zoning on lots of similar size. Uh, in addition, uh, there was also a variance granted for the garage that we just recently granted a, a variance for uh, so that it could exist on uh, the property without a primary dwelling. So it was sitting on the middle lot. Uh, there was a house that was built late 1800s on the easterly lot. And then there was my client's house uh, that was on the uh, westerly lot. Uh, having uh, gotten that Later, Dr. Smith decided to apply for a building permit. And this was to renovate uh, the existing house. Uh, plans included uh, three separate furnaces and a, a fire escape uh, for the third floor. Uh, Jody, if we could go through a couple of the other uh, slides, starting with number four. Uh, this first slide uh, shows uh, the existing house uh, as it appears now. Um, it has a parking in the front yard, has a yard on the side uh, and in the rear. Um, on the uh, next slide, um, we have the uh, parking area. It's associated with the uh, school building for Sacred Heart. And uh, you can see uh, my client's property uh, to the rear of that parking lot. Uh, slide number six, which is the next one, uh, shows the school building uh, and the additional parking that wraps around uh, to the south side uh, of my client's property. And slide number seven, uh, which is the, uh, shows the house that was on the easterly lot, uh, the garage, which is in red, um, which was what you granted the height and uh, setback variance for uh, back in May. Uh, the, the next slide is taken uh, one property to the east, and this shows uh, the development of other properties. The, the one to the rear involves uh, three units on one parcel, uh, and there's a relatively new uh, two-family uh, that is on the right-hand side of that picture. Uh, the, uh, the next slide shows the rear and side of my client and shows the fire escape uh, that was uh, constructed in 1985. Uh, as part of this uh, renovation, uh, there were also three electrical meters installed. Uh, and when we submitted this application, uh, we included an affidavit from the electrician who worked on it at the time, Robert Merchant, uh, who states that he installed the three electric meters for the three apartments and had that work inspected by the town. Uh, we also included an affidavit uh, from George Smith III, who's the current owner of the building and, and son of Dr. Smith who work. Um, and stated that he's owned it since 1991 uh, and that uh, the building has always had uh, the three apartments since he acquired it. Uh, lastly, uh, as part of our application, we submitted uh, an additional affidavit from Barbara Johnson, 
uh, who is Dr. Smith's daughter, uh, stating that uh, the house always had uh, three apartments. Um, uh, in slide number 10, which is the next one, uh, it shows the three boilers or, or furnaces in the basement uh, that were uh, shown on the uh, floor plans for the basement at the time uh, the building permit uh, was uh, submitted. Uh, the, uh, the other interesting thing that we, we were trying to, to work on was uh, why install a fire escape uh, and so I asked Rudy Rittberg uh, to do a, a code analysis of what was required by the building code in 1985. Uh, the building code that was in effect in 1985 had been adopted in 1975. Uh, and it states, and uh, attached uh, on the next uh, slide is Rudy's letter. Uh, and then he attached the code sections that were applicable. And what he found was that for a two family house, no second means of egress is required. It's only required for a three or more units uh, on, a, uh, on a, uh, a, a residential building. So uh, a fire escape, which is the second means of egress that's being provided here, it would only be needed for three or more units and would not have been required for uh, just uh, two uh, units uh, on the first and second floor. Uh, uh, as it uh, was in 1986, when the work was completed, uh, the building has uh, two one bedroom apartments, one on the first floor, one on the second floor, and a, a studio uh, in the attic which is uh, reached by both an interior staircase uh, and a fire escape on uh, the rear of the building. Um, it, I have to say in, in the 80s, the um, uh, zoning enforcement was not quite as uh, sophisticated and as on top of things as it is now. Uh, and the zoning enforcement officer at the time uh, with uh, uh, perhaps not as thorough as our current zoning enforcement officer is uh, in dealing with these uh, types of issues and may not have documented that, uh, in fact, uh, there, there were the three units here. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there is not something in the town uh, records that we have been able to find uh, that shows uh, that there were three units. Uh, when Dr. Smith received his variances in 1985, he could have built three two family houses, one on each of the 5,000 square foot lots that the board had approved. In 2004, however, uh, the family applied to the Planning and Zoning Commission and were granted a lot line revision, which essentially split the middle 5,000 square foot lot in half and added 2,500 square feet to this property and 2,500 square feet to the house lot on the east side of the property. Uh, so the uh, lot at 56 Gold Street, which currently has a single family house, uh, could have a two family house uh, built on it, um, even though it's currently sing a single family. But my point is uh, that by uh, creating this uh, lot split and adding the 2,500 square foot feet to each of the other two lots. Uh, we've ended up with a, a number of units that is a maximum of five, the three that's in my client's current building and the maximum of two that would be permitted at 56 Gold Street. Of course, if there had been, uh, uh, if, if they had stayed with the uh, three lots that the board had approved, they would be able to have six uh, units rather than uh, five. So under the current configuration, we have one less than what the board would have permitted as part of the 1985 uh, variances uh, that were uh, granted. Um, uh, and I would add that uh, uh, my client's house only has three bedrooms. 
as a as new construction, uh, it would be more likely that there would be double that um, as part of building on a 7,500 square foot lot uh, because you have quite a bit more room uh, to add additional uh, and of course uh, substantially more uh, square footage. Uh, using the assessor's records, uh, we did a, a density analysis. And Jody, if you could bring up uh, slide uh, 15, please. Uh, so what we were looking for here uh, was uh, the original lots from that 1901 uh, map uh, that was recorded with the town clerk. We wanted to show what the lot area for each parcel was, the number of units, and the square footage per unit. Uh, and what we found was that uh, 14 of the 21 properties were non-conforming uh, in lot area, and that 16 of the 21 were non-conforming uh, as to a density. Um, as with uh, 46 and 56 that received half of one of the original lots, there are some others in the neighborhood that uh, have, uh, have been, become larger by uh, combining them. Uh, and um, uh, along with these, uh, uh, at least two thirds of them are in the range of lot size from 3,480 to 6,272. Uh, and all are, are non-conforming uh, area. Uh, this is a densely developed neighborhood uh, with many of the properties uh, being a non-conforming. Uh, so as part of this application, we're asking you to either confirm that the existing building is legal as a three family house based on the building permit history, uh, or to grant a density variance to permit the attic studio apartment, uh, which has been there since 1985, but to remain. Um, we only got one comment from uh, the neighborhood, and that was from the church. Uh, and they asked whether we were looking to add on to the building at all. Uh, we told them that that was not the case. We were just looking to confirm it what's that, uh, confirm what's there, uh, and they had no problem uh, with that. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I believe this is a very unique situation uh, that involves uh, the, the family and this particular property. Uh, in terms of the hardship here, I believe that it's the property is situated in the neighborhood, substantially developed prior to the adoption of the zoning regulations. And therefore we would ask for your approval. Thank you. Tom, this is Pat Kirkpatrick for the record. The, um, doesn't the tax card, I'm trying to get it to pull up, but I can't get it to pull up. Doesn't the tax card show it as three? Hasn't it been taxed as a three? It's been taxed as a three since it was finished in 1986. And in fact, although I didn't submit it for the record, uh, the fire marshal has been uh, coming to the property uh, to inspect it and fire marshal only <coughs> inspects properties that have three or more units on them. Okay, so that adds to the sort of strength. All right, the other question is, so um, there's no plan to tear it down and build a new house though? This is spe specifically for this building. Uh, I think if you tore it down and rebuilt it, you'd be looking at uh, meeting the current requirements, which would be a two family house. I, I so would would, so that, we uh, wouldn't need to condition it for that if we chose to. Uh, I, I think you certainly could. I don't think it's, it's necessary, but uh, if, certainly uh, that, if that I could, would... I think, I think we're getting into the, maybe your variance questions, which I just want to remind the board that this is two appeals. One of my decision and one of a variance and the state law says you have to when they're both joined you have to um vote on the decision first before the variance is heard 
So I just wanted to, everybody to keep that in mind. Before it's heard or before? Right. 8-6A, uh, whenever an application zoning board of appeals to grant the variance is joined with an appeal or any order made by the official charge of the enforcement, um, the board shall first decide the issues presented by such appeal. <clears throat> Yeah, but, yeah, but we don't vote till the end. So how does right. that work, Jody? You have to, you have to split it. You have to do it before. Well, what you just read, Jody, as Pat says, says you can't decide the second issue before deciding the first. Which doesn't is true. You can't right. Hear argument of both of them. At least what you right doesn't mean you can't hear it. Well, the, okay. The, we both, the point thought... is, is the point is, is there's no sense in hearing the second because. The reason why they do this is because if you vote to overturn the decision, then the very it's mooted and you don't need to hear the second one. And that's the whole reason behind that. <laughs> but in but the flip side, this is Pat again for the record. The flip side is that we can't hear once we close and go to voting, we can't hear any more. No, it's so two there's how this, we can this handle is, that. So this this has to be taken in two. You have to hear the decision first. Okay, and that has to be decided, and then you hear the variance. You decide on the variance. You can, I mean, you can take all the stuff that Tom mentioned in, into consideration, but this right now should just be all discussions pertaining to the decision. Okay, well, because that's what you have to decide on first. I guess I I disagree as a matter. Of, I mean, unless you can show what I'm missing. Uh, this is Joe Anglin, by the way. Uh, just you know, wearing my lawyer's hat now, just from what you read. Uh, it simply order it indicates the sequence in which decisions must be made that says nothing about whether you can hear both arguments. I understand your point, Jody, that perhaps the reason for that rule is an efficiency reason, but that gives a countervailing efficiency reason here relating to the fact that we don't normally hear everything and then go and make okay. our decisions later. So I think, okay. I, so I, therefore, I think it's in Pat's discretion which way we do it. So let me just go a little further. Um, the reason why I also brought it up is because I, I believe this this appeal also needs variances in two other sections because the if if the decision is upheld, then this you would also require uh, you would also require a site plan approval, and you would also need another section six dash ninety eight of variance of which we're not requested tonight. So this is not a simple decision that can be made tonight on the variance anyhow because it requires two other sections to be varied which were not requested tonight which is why I bring that up so I mean we can discuss uh, I hear what you're saying but in the essence of time I don't see a point because if this has to come back for two other sections or also has to go for site plan approval the, the discussions tonight I don't I don't see a, a reason to discuss the variance tonight if it's not ready for that. Madam Chair, if I could just be heard on uh, on these points. Could you speak to that, Tom? Yes, please. Uh, on the first point, uh, I, I believe that uh, Jody's right, that you have to decide one before the other. Since all of it involves just this one building, I've presented it as one, uh, but uh, he's correct. You, you need to vote on first the appeal and then secondly on the variance if, if the uh, appeal uh, is, is not uh, uh, approved. Uh, in terms of the other sections, I, I used 6-205 because that's our zoning chart. And that's what says for R6 zone, it's single for and two family. Um, and, I, and although that is echoed as well in section 6-98, uh, I, uh, I think this covers that as well because it does say it's one and two family and we're seeking to have it approved uh, formalized as a uh, as a three family uh, uh, I, I may have to go also to get site plan approval from the planning and zoning commission but that that would be the second step if it's necessary if planning and zoning thinks I need to do that then I will go to them as well but uh, there's no point in going and asking them uh, for uh, a site plan if I don't know that I have uh, the, the unit uh, approved uh, by this board. Okay. And one more question, Tom. This is Pat again yeah. for the record. 
the um what's how did this come up that you needed that this got caught or you applied for a permit how did this come up because uh, obviously it's been in existence theoretically for this what, 33 years my uh at the uh recommendation of their primary council uh uh they they were recommended to me to review whether in fact there was a record in the town hall uh, documents that would show that this is a valid three family house uh and uh -huh. I, that's when i started the investigation the information that i came up with uh, and uh and that's when i i said to the to mr smith uh, that I can't find anything that says it's a three-family house in the in the town hall records, and therefore, uh, I recommended that we take this step. Okay. And, and enough here that it it, it just made me wonder. Uh, uh, you don't put in a fire escape for a two-family house. You you have a, a staircase inside that's more than adequate to get to the attic space. You only put it in there if you're going to have a separate unit. And plus, when we talked to the electrician, he said, no, we're wiring this as, as three separate units. We have three meters uh, and um, we had three boilers or furnaces put in uh, for each of the units. So uh, everything in 1985 indicated to me that somehow, however it got through the process, this was designed and built as a, as a three family house. And, uh, and that's why I, I brought that up. And then I went further with the, uh, the density study, uh, to show really how this neighborhood is developed and that, uh, to retain these units, which are, I would describe modest, uh, in size two one bedrooms and a studio, uh, are not, uh, impacting the neighborhood in terms of being it uh, overcrowded or uh, more densely developed and that it's very much in keeping uh, with the rest of the neighborhood that's there and and i think that the chart bears that out thank you jody uh yeah <clears throat> do you want to do you want to give your side and then we'll come back to sure the yes um for the record jody kutcher um, as Tom said, this is, this started back when the original council came to me, um, and asked me to see if they can confirm that it was a, a legal three family. And, um, I actually went a little bit further than I usually did. I, I did a lot of the research myself and as I normally do, I, I look in a few different sp uh, places and, um, what I would have found if this, the conversion that was done properly, I would have found approvals from three different departments uh the first being the building department uh would have found a record for it um you can all see on your screen here is the permit tom's referring to from 1985 i've highlighted the area where it says present use of building one family if changed use as and it marks it down as a one family to two family dwelling and then below i highlighted the fact uh, the that mention of one new kitchen and not two. Um, on the next screen here, I have the floor plan for the attic. You can see that there is the, the, the attic floor plan is labeled as a playroom. Um, and you'll see if you look at the floor plan, you will see no kitchen noted on here. Um, now there's a note on here also that says an all bedroom provide egress window. Uh, doesn't say anything about stairs, so I'll agree with that, but it does not show a third unit. If you look at the second floor, you'll clearly see the mention of a kitchen, bedroom, dining room, living room, all the things you would see in the unit. You don't see that in the attic. Um, also, certificate of occupancy uh, notes add an altered dwelling, convert one family to two family dwelling. Now, the uh, third or the second approval that I would have found was a planning and zoning approval um, from the planning and zoning commission because in 85 it was required that if you were either constructing a new three family or converting from two to a three you need 
site plan approval by the planning zoning commission um, i haven't found anything and i haven't been presented anything the third approval would have been from this board because at the time um, and I think this is one of the reasons why there, there was no conversion noted on the permit is because it just wouldn't have been permitted at the time you would have needed 4,200 square feet of land area per family. So for this three family to have been converted, you would have need 12,600 square feet of land area, which it didn't have. It had 7,500 feet. Um, now there's some going back and forth with lot lines and everything, but the largest this lot has had is what it has today, which is 7,500. Uh, there was, I think, I believe a special permit process that the commission could have lowered that to 3,200 square feet per family. But again, I don't see any special permits for that approval. Um, so, I mean, I find no trail. I mean, this is 1985 when we're doing research as far as the legality of the three family is uh, as new as you're going to get when we're doing research. I mean, that is, is fairly new, and these are accurate records. Uh, they're fairly clear. There's no question about it. It's converting from one to a two. And again, just the fact that it did, it physically just did not have the land area to convert to a three-family is why I think it wasn't converted to a three-family, at least on the permit. Um, so if you all have any uh, questions... Jody, this permit says 56 Gold Street. And yeah, we went back. Is four, is yeah, we six. went back and forth. We went back. This was, we discussed this week um, with the original council and Tom. If you, and, and Tom can probably concur this, we were, I, I did the same thing too when I researched the records and I actually ended up looking at the footprint of the houses. Uh, but we did come to the conclusion that this permit for 56 Gold was actually for 46. And um, I think it's just because both lots are in the same ownership is why, what the mix up in the address was. But you can note the, um, if you look, I can zoom in on this back portion. I believe on uh, either one of the photos or the aerial, you can see this little narrow strip right over in here. You'll see going out to the staircase in the back. You can see that either on the aerial or the, uh, uh, the photo I believe Tom presented in the application. Uh, that, uh, there was some confusion in the assessor's records as to which uh, uh, number was appropriate. Uh, this is number 46, and the house that was on the easterly lot of uh, Dr. Smith had is 56. So th th this is, the, I, I don't think there was a, any confusion in terms of the, these were the plans that were submitted uh, for this particular house. Um, I, uh, I, I would have to say uh, that uh, even in 1985, 35 years ago, uh, these kinds of things did happen. And even more recently, and why a zoning permit was now, is now required, and then there's a formal process with an application, with an application fee uh, that deals with any kind of confusion that can come about between uh, uh, the particular use or or uh, or construction uh, that's being proposed. So uh, uh, I I don't I don't, I, I, I don't really think it's confusion when if if I would say it's confusion if it was noted somewhere that it was a three family, but it's clearly marked as a playroom and it's converting from one to two. So I don't think there's confusion on the permitting side. Uh, uh, Having looked at this, I, I think there's some something happened, something went on uh, uh, that clearly would not happen today, uh, but is the case here. Uh, that's really my only point on this. Yeah, corruption. So just to end my part of it, um, what I what the, the the two applications you have in front of you, one is for the variance, the second or the first is for the appeal of my decision. And I just, um, the, the, I guess the question is, is if you clearly see this, everything documentation wise and lack of approvals or the approvals that are there notes a two family, then um, I'm not sure how I would, or how the board would see, see the decision, my decision being incorrect if 
I did not see it as a three family. So that's why I would leave it. Uh, uh, and and uh, in all candor and, and uh, fairness to, to Jody, uh, I'm not finding that in the town hall records. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's why I also uh, made the uh, made the application for the variance uh, because uh, I, I think there is uh, a, a hardship here. I think there is a uh, uh, a, a uh, continuity of the, the neighborhood. Uh, clearly, uh, in the last thirty five years, there have not been any problems uh, with this. This isn't something that a uh, a neighbor brought up or uh, as a, a complaint. Uh, this is something that was brought up by the, the homeowner themselves uh, yeah, trying yeah. to uh, clarify I'm this. And of course, it was originally done by Dr. Smith, who has passed away. So we don't have some of that background, uh, even though it's still in the same family. Uh, and, uh, th and that's why I asked for uh, the variance. Uh, as part of this as well. And because there's a parking lot nearby, there's no issues with parking. So there's never been neighbor issues. Uh, this this uh, property has the four parking spaces in the front. Uh, as I mentioned, these are two one bedroom apartments and a uh, and a studio. So parking has not not been an issue at all. Uh, there is parking on the street, and of course there is parking at, at uh, uh, Sacred Heart uh, uh, School Building. And if if for some reason we were willing to grant the variance, or probably not in the overturning, because that would be a different scenario totally. But would you be willing to? Um, deed one of them is affordable no uh i i that you know that would have been another approach i uh I no. did discuss that with the clients uh uh their i guess their concern is not being able to choose the tenants themselves uh i think in a practical sense this is below what affordable would be. Uh, uh, the current rent for the uh, studio uh, is $1,100. And uh, the affordable uh, for a studio would be over $1,300. Uh, so in a practical sense, uh, you very much have uh, a, an affordable housing unit. And frankly, uh, the other two uh, are in the affordable range as well. I think th this is one of those, uh, I, I think about a uh, project that I brought into you on Davis Avenue across from Wilbur Peck Court. This is probably uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and it was an older building. Uh, and we were looking to uh, tear it down and build a new. And a lot of the discussion had to do with the fact that the existing building provided affordable housing in a de facto way. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and the board did not see fit to approve the variances that I was requesting, and uh, and so the existing building uh, that they were looking to replace has in fact uh, remained, uh, and this family is looking to be able to retain this building as it is. Uh, I, I think the the condition uh, that was discussed earlier. Uh, that uh, it would have to be maintained as it is, and if uh, it's removed, uh, that it uh, re reverts to the uh, the two units that are permitted under the zoning. But you wouldn't be, you don't think your client would be willing to specifically deed it to, to affordable? No. So that would come, if, if you had to go that direction, I guess you're going to the commission and then that, you can take it up there anyhow, but... Yes. Since I'm on an affordable housing task force, I have to bring that up. Uh, it, 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 the town doesn't get credit for it to try to get to that 10% cap. 
uh, that we would no longer be subject to affordable housing uh, requirements. Uh, but right now we're at five percent of affordable housing in town, which is a significant number, and there are a lot of affordable housing units. Uh, but I don't think this one apartment is going to get us closer to that goal in any significant way. No, but if we if we allowed density, but only a, a deeded thing, then it does help us in the long run. But anyhow, that's another story for another day. Yeah, and, 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 and one that I'm interested in pursuing, but not with this particular property. Got it. Does anyone else on the board have questions for either Tom or Jody? Uh, Tom, this is Joe Anglin. Um, do you agree that back in 1985, either a variance or other form of waiver would have been required to have this uh, uh, built as a three uh, three family? Yes. Yes. I, okay. I, I, well, a, a number of your arguments, like the three boilers, the three elect electric meters, you know, uh, and the uh, the reference to the uh, fire escape are intended to suggest that certainly the owners, maybe even some people at the town, have the idea in their mind that it might be a uh, three-unit development. But as a legal matter, does that matter? Is there any case law that uh, you could cite that says that if a variance is required and you don't get it, but if you look back in time and see if people were kind of thinking <laughs> that the variance uh, essentially uh, was had been granted that that even matters right. from a legal point of view. Jesus no, I, I, I point out all of the things about the three boilers and the three meters and the fire escape because it, it wasn't adding up for me. Normally when I do the research and Jody did his as well, uh, th there's something that comes out that shows you why it happened the way it did. And I, I have, I have not found that. Um, but well, have just to be clear, my question is: I understand why it looks confusing. I get that. But my question is: Does it matter? Uh, in, in terms of legality of it, no, no, no. And that, and that's really why I did the the variants for the neighborhood and life for the variants. Yes. That's all for me. Anyone else have questions? And then I'll ask now, just because it's easier than asking in the middle of deliberations, Jody, can you, or both of you, can you speak to if we decided to uphold Jody's decision and you were going for the variance, what would the process be? We would then vote on the variance, but that doesn't make it so you then still have to go to, or we're not really allowed to hear the variance. No, I, I submitted them what would be referred to in legal terms, pleading the alternative. So I'm saying you can do one or you can do the other. Uh, in, in terms of Jody's point earlier, you need to vote on the request uh, uh, to overrule his ruling. Uh, but, uh, but you can also then consider the second as the variance that we've requested as well. Jody, does that make sense to you? You were saying that we couldn't, though. You're muted. You're muted. Good. No, not that you couldn't. It's just that you that you have to decide on the appeal first. I get that. Right, and that the, the it is you decide on the appeal because if you decide on the variance and then you go back to the appeal and you say, well, the appeal, the decision, the enforcement officer was incorrect, then you have a variance that means nothing because you know that you need to it's a chicken before the egg the decision comes before the egg if the decision is I got that then you need the variance so okay one last question at what point is there any can either one of you find any record as to when the town started taxing it as a three family because that is the flip side to everything you're both saying sort of which is well wait a minute you've been paying for it as a three family unit I I always I, I get that a lot when I'm doing these and I've had units that have been a while, around a lot longer than 85 and um, what I just say to them is if you were getting taxed that's because you were using it and such. I mean, you don't get, if you're using it as a three family, you're getting taxed as a three family. That does not mean it's legally a three family. You're getting taxed on what you had. Um, 
So. Uh, it, it's been since the 80s, that to answer your question. So when they finished and got everything, they started taxing it as three family? Because yeah, the assessor looks Walks around it's being used and and with a three family you have to provide uh financial information as well as just the the assessor uh, looking at the building itself okay anyone else have any questions any questions from the audience i don't see any hands and i don't see any chip either all right well we can go All right, we'll end that one and we'll go to 38 Bush Avenue, Art. Let me just okay. bring uh, yeah. one second. Just hold on. Let me just bring um, Mr. Vecchiola back in. All right, for the record, Joe England sits out now and John Vecchiola sits in. Okay, appeal number four, 38 Bush. Is it okay to go? Uh, just, John, you're there? John, on mute. John Vecchiola. Not till the end. Are you there, John? I'm here, 